When Steel Talks, everybody listen. Um, some world famous musicians to play for you today. So it will be a talk and a performance, and we're really happy to have all these folks here today. So give them a warm welcome. Thank you, Professor Jensen Bolton. Everybody hear me okay? Yes. All right. Um, well, thank you so much for coming. Um, let me real quick say thanks to Rosamund King and Dale Mayum. Uh, Dale from Caribbean Studies and Rosamond from the uh, Wolf Institute who helped uh, put this on. Um, and special welcome to the students of Alea Ringitsing. Um, uh, you're all in the Caribbeanization of North America, right? Yeah. All right. Yes. Well, this topic ought to make sense, I would hope, yeah. since it's about a carnival right here in North America. And uh, I'd also like to uh, welcome when Steel talks uh, up here. Um, maybe if we're lucky, some of this will end up uh, on the web on when Steel talks on his website, which is all about um, steel pan and uh, carnival music in Brooklyn. We shall see. Um, so yeah, uh, here's the uh, book. Uh, it's called Jump Up: Caribbean Carnival Music in New York City. Um, I first got interested in carnival music um, back in 1984 back when most of you weren't even born. Uh, um, I had a friend um, who said, you know, you've got to come see this, this, this carnival parade in Brooklyn. Uh, uh, I was a graduate student then. He said, it's got incredible music. Because you do, I like blues and gospel and uh, you know, that kind of music. And so I went, and I was totally blown away. Uh, uh, back in those days, um, by the way, how many people have been to the Eastern Parkway Carnival? A lot of you, yeah, and, and that's the picture of it, in case you don't know. Um, back in those days, they didn't have the steel kind of fences that kept you off of the parkway. If you were just watching, everybody could like blend together. So I was able to run out and uh, actually get with a steel band and help pull a pan up the parkway, and it was just just amazing. Mola music then was really from steel bands, uh, uh, not the sound trucks that we have today. So I really fell in love with the music. Um, I did a little bit of writing about it. Uh, uh, in the late 90s about Steel Pan and about the new Jouvet celebration. How many events did Jouvet? A few of you, okay. Um, and um, then sort of came back to it five or six years later, uh, deciding, uh, uh, five or six years ago, deciding, you know, there really is not a good book on Brooklyn Carnival or New York Carnival uh, or a book on the music. So um, that's um, uh, what sort of got the thing going. And um, here is the book. Um, Running back and forth here. I this so the music that I'm going to be talking about, which I think a lot of you are probably somewhat familiar with, uh, comes from the island of Trinidad, which is right off of um, uh, Venezuela here, the southernmost of the uh, uh, Eastern Antilles Islands, uh, English-speaking islands. Um, how many people are from Trinidad or families from Trinidad? Let's see. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Um, and um, the music I'm going to be looking at are steel band music, um, which is the music which is performed on uh, uh, what they originally discarded oil drums, which were carved and hammered up um, so that they look a little bit like this. And you can actually play melodies on them, as uh, Garvin Blake will soon demonstrate. Um, the other form of music uh, is called calypso, uh, which was the um, folk music of um, Trinidad. Uh, in the late 19th, early 20th century, it was really vocal music. And Calypsonians were known as these great uh, singers who could improvise uh, and poke fun at the authorities and so forth. Uh, uh, their songs were often humorous and sensual, uh, and, uh, and again, often satirical. So Calypso has been a very important tradition of music in the Caribbean. Um, it later morphed into what we call soca, which maybe you're more familiar with, which stands for soul Calypso. So I take it that's a term you've heard somewhere. Maybe power soaker or chutney soaker and so forth. Yeah, yeah, OK. All right, so those are the two kinds of musics um, that the book is about. Um, Car <coughs> Carnival first came to Trinidad. Um, it was imported by the French planters who settled the island uh, in the 18th century. Um, and of course, Carnival was a time of uh, great partying and bacchanal and carrying on in Europe, uh, in places like France and Italy, um, Spain, Catholic Europe. Uh, and it it was, uh, took place on what's called Fat Tuesday, which is the day before Ash Wednesday. 
Uh, and that was a day when everybody would really party, basically. Uh, a lot of food and drink and dance and masquerading. Uh, and then, good, uh, um, sorry, uh, Ash Wednesday would come, and you were supposed to live this you know, very um, austere, uh, 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 nice lifestyle leading up to six weeks to Easter. So that's where Carnival, the idea came from. But when Carnival got to Trinidad, uh, uh, very quickly it uh, morphed into this new form because the African slaves and then the freed slaves uh, after 1830 kind of took it over and Africanized it. And so a great deal of the music that we'll hear coming out of Carnival has a very strong African base in terms of the strong rhythms, improvisation, call and response, and uh, a lot of stuff you'll hear shortly. So, um, uh, in fact, a lot of the New World Carnivals if you think of not just uh, Trinidad, but of course Mardi Gras, mm -hmm. right, in, Louis in uh, Louisiana, and uh, the big carnival in Rio and Brazil, they're all very um, Africanized. They don't really look so much like European carnival anymore. So, um, uh, but here's just a picture of a uh, of, of footprint from uh, uh, late 19th century Port of Spain, the capital of Trinidad, of people out playing carnival in the streets. Now, my book is not about um, carnival in Trinidad. Uh, or carnival music in Trinidad. Other people have written about that extensively. Um, what my book is about uh, is about the diaspora of carnival and carnival music to New York. Uh, and the kind of lens that I'm using I call diasporic transnationalism. Uh, big couple of words, but you all are very familiar with the concept of diaspora, I assume, right? Yes. You've been studying that, which is the transfer or the, the, the um, migration of people and a culture from one place to another. Uh, and often we think about um, uh, diaspora as being kind of a one-way thing. You know, people left wherever they left there, and they got there, and that was that. Uh, but in fact, in the 20th century, and in our, our new, more global age, that's not the case. The idea of transnationalism comes in, transnationalism suggesting the movement of people, culture, um, uh, commercial goods, and so forth, back and forth across international borders, right? So it's not just one to the other, it's kind of a back and forth circular thing, which is what the diasporic transnationalism really translates into. I'm interested in the book in the way that musicians and singers and uh, band leaders, um, uh, people who organize carnival masquerade bands, uh, people who produce records, how they move back and forth between Trinidad and the other um, West Indian islands and New York in a kind of a loop going back and forth, uh, kind of really influencing each other. And in fact, the loop got really big because big carnivals were also established. Anybody know where else in North America? Where's the other really big carnival besides New York? Miami. Miami and Toronto, right? And then across the ocean in London, in Notting Hill, right? So these all form this big kind of loop of carnival um, culture that's circulating around in what we would call diasporic transnationalism because they always land in communities where there are a lot of West Indian people, be they London, Toronto, Brooklyn, right, Miami, and so forth. So the book is divided into four sections. The first section um, uh, deals with Harlem Carnival. And um, uh, Brooklyn was not always the center of West Indian culture here in Brooklyn, uh, in uh, New York, as many probably know. The initial uh, uh, community was over in Harlem. And so in the 1930s, you had these dance orchestras and Calypsonians, like the Duke of Iron, Houdini, or Invader, um, who would perform for uh, basically uh, pre lent carnival dances. In other words, that weekend right before um, uh, Ash Wednesday, they'd have a big dance someplace at a hall in, uh, Car in uh, Harlem. And Calypsonians who came from Trinidad would be brought in to sing. And people would sometimes wear costumes and uh, kind of get into a little bit of um, masquerading. But of course, in February, which is when, right, when uh, uh, Ash Wednesday usually is, it's a little cold, right, uh, to be running around outside and really playing carnival. And carnival is really much an outdoor, it's very much an outdoor kind of an event. And so they decided, eventually, when they wanted an outdoor carnival in um, New York, to move it to Labor Day because the weather's warm. It was a time when they could work with the uh, authorities to shut down the streets to have a big parade. And so starting in 1947, we have our first carnival parade in, in Harlem going up 7th Avenue. Um, and here's a couple pictures. This is Rudy King from his steel band. 
an early steel band in the 1950s out on 7th Avenue. This is Daphne Weeks. Um, if you can barely see her up there on top, she's uh, mounted up there. She was a band leader, and uh, they were Calypso singers on a float that they were, again, pulling up uh, 7th Avenue. So that's what was going on in Harlem, and that's the first couple of chapters of the book. kind of goes through that history. Then we move out to the second part of the book, which is Brooklyn Comes to Eastern Parkway. Um, uh, they closed down the Harlem Carnival in the early 60s. There were actually some issues that they call, quote, riots, um, which really, in retrospect, appears to be a couple of bricks were thrown or something. But uh, uh, the authorities, uh, always, the carnival's always a little transgressive, always a little dangerous, right? And uh, so the uh, civil authorities are always a little worried about it. So they closed it down. Meanwhile, West Indians were migrating out of Harlem to voila, Brooklyn, right? Right here, central Brooklyn, where we stand right now. <clears throat> and um, so by the late 60s, these little carnival parades started cropping up in Brooklyn. And eventually, we get a big carnival parade down Eastern Parkway in 1971. And there um, are the BWI Sonatas, who are a steel band. Um, uh, that's 1977. You can see all the um, uh, party goers are sort of gathered around them. They're being pushed up Eastern Parkway, and people are dancing, or what's called whining, uh, uh, as they go along. So there's a really nice picture of a steel band. Uh, you don't see many steel bands on Eastern Parkway anymore, right? And if you see any, uh, let me know. Uh, uh, because there haven't been any for some time. Maybe one or two, but not many. Because they've been replaced by these big sound trucks, which you all are probably familiar. Anybody who's going to Carnival, you've seen these. Or you heard them, right? Yeah. How can you not hear them? <laughs> uh, right, so they're playing the latest soca, or reggae, or Haitian compass, uh, maybe even some Latin music, but it's mostly DJs, uh, sometimes a live band, but highly amplified, very loud. You can see the fancy costumes here, people gathered around the sound trucks and so forth on Eastern Parkway. So that's something, you know, if, if you haven't been, I recommend go see it. Uh, uh, this is Labor Day, every Labor Day. It's been 51 years now. Going on 52, maybe 52 years we've had the parade. So uh, um, that uh, story is told. Um, <coughs> um, oh, I know what I'm saying. So the steel bands got kind of pushed off of the parkway because those sound trucks were so loud you couldn't hear them. And they end up landing in um, what's called Panorama, which is a big contest for steel bands uh, that they have on the Saturday of Labor Day weekend. Um, Anybody here? Anybody here playing a steel band? It's been in Panorama? Not one person? Come on, someone must be out there. All right. Uh, anyway, uh, I'm sure you probably know some people because there are actually a lot of young people who play uh, in these bands. And that's a big competition. And I thought, let me let you uh, now hear a little music. So here is um, here's the Chasm Steel Orchestra. Uh, this is from 2010. We're in back of the Brooklyn Museum. Okay, hundred pieces, a uh, hundred piece ensemble up there of these steel pans, uh, led by Arden Herbert, who was another graduate of Brooklyn College. And anyway, they sound like this. any of this on YouTube. There are many, many wonderful um, um, uh, uh, videos of, of this uh, stuff. And in fact, uh, When Steel Talks, uh, as one of the organizations, has put a lot of this stuff up on the uh, line. So you can hear it for yourselves. All right. Um, the, uh, back here. Um, The next section of the book uh, is uh, on Jouvet. Now, the Eastern Parkway is the big parade on Monday afternoon, right? 
But Monday morning, we have what's called Juve, which is break of day in French Creole. Uh, and it basically signals the beginning of Carnival, especially um, back in Trinidad. It was actually an emancipation um, celebration uh, when the slaves were freed uh, way back in the uh, middle of the 19th century. Uh, so unlike the Eastern Parkway uh, parade, instead of these big fancy costumes, people tend to dress down and they have They'll you know, put on mud and oil and dirt and paint and so forth, uh, uh, often sort of demonic uh, costumes. Uh, these are jab jab devils. You know, this person's got a uh, bucket of oil, kind of spreading it around. Um, so uh, the, the costumes are very different, very traditional. Um, but what's particularly interesting about Jouvet is that we have um, no sound trucks, no DJs, only traditional steel pan. And that's something uh, that's been going on since the mid-90s, and they've really kept to those rules. So um, you'll only see steel bands and rhythm sections, and often they're being pushed and pulled along. So if you like steel band music on the road, as they say, Juve is the place to go. Uh, in fact, it's really the only place, even the big carnival back in Trinidad, there's Juve, they still have sound trucks there along with the steel bands. Uh, so if you want pure, unadulterated, uh, steel band music, Brooklyn Jouvet is it. And I tried to talk a lot about why that is in uh, terms of a revival of older Trinidadian uh, carnival traditions. So um, that's uh, Jouvet. The final section of the book um, deals with recording of Soka and Calypso in Brooklyn. Uh, and the fact Brooklyn actually became the center of Soka music production in the 1980s. And very much thanks to the efforts of these two gentlemen, Granville Straker, uh, who started Straker Records um, back in the late 1960s. He had a record shop on Utica Avenue, eventually um, started uh, uh, recording uh, Calypsonians and soca artists, and um, became a leading producer of soca records. The other person is Ralston Charles, who we see right here. And some of you have been to Charlie's Calypso City? On Fulton Street, still there, right? Go get yourself some doubles and go over there and check it out. Charlie still sells vinyl. And this isn't like some retro nouveau hipster vinyl thing. He's been selling vinyl since, you know, 1970 when he started the, uh, the place. So he still has vinyl records in there. Um, and he's, uh, again, had a studio and was a major producer of many, many um, important soca records in the 80s and 90s. These are just a few of the people that uh, worked with uh, Charlie and Granville Straker, uh, The Mighty Sparrow, Calypso Rose, David Rudder, Arrow, you probably maybe know the tune Hot, 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 someplace that's come across your radar from back in the 80s, okay. Uh, I should also say that uh, Ralston Charles um, is the subject of a wonderful film that uh, his daughter, um, Tina Charles, just put together. You know Tina Charles from the New York Liberty? Yes. Basketball? Yeah, okay. This is Wilson's um, daughter. Uh, and uh, she put this wonderful film together, which happens to be playing at the Brooklyn Academy of Music tonight. So if you've got something, nothing to do tonight, 7.30, it's a part of a Caribbean film festival um, at the Brooklyn Academy of Music. It's called, appropriately enough, Charlie's Records. Uh, and I think Tina and uh, Rolson Charles will be there and they'll be able to interview and stuff. So put that on your busy social calendar. Uh, anyway, all right. So let me play you um, just one quick piece of soca music and then we'll um, actually meet some of the live artists. Um, uh, this is Swallow, who's actually from Antigua, not Trinidad, but uh, became uh, a, a very good friends and close to Rolston Charles. And here um, is one of his great silver pieces called Subway Jam. Um, going the wrong way, come on. Subway Jam, there we go. Uh, let me put it up here. This was in 1983 um, that uh, he recorded this song. And as you can see, it's, uh, it's all about um, New York subways. <laughs> Synthesizers, uh, uh, 
uh, very modern sounding for 1983. I'm uh, sorry, 1981. I was going to catch a train in the subway when I hear strange song coming from down there. So I see people, so I hear music. The young and the old, if you see a young kids, school be my conjurer, Masaya Sugar Finger, all them DJs take over. Imagine them DJs have new dark subway like this and back wherever they So I really love this song because. Um, First of all, it, it's such a New York topic, right? Uh, and and um, some of the earlier clips, those people actually wrote about um, um, people just driving to New York being totally baffled and getting lost on the subway. Well, here, um, the West Indians have completely taken over the subway. Okay, Not only do they know how to get around, but they've taken it over and they've turned it into a big party, just like on Eastern Parkway. I love the thing, every subway station is steaming with action, places like a disco, no train in motion. The man in the booth is selling the tokens. Leave the booth to come out and join the action. Can you imagine the booth takers coming out again? Like, what a great image. So I asked Swallow, whose name is Rupert Philo, by the way, um, like, how did you write this song? What, you know, what, what came about? And he said, this is what he told me. He said, so early one morning following an all-night recording session in the middle of midtown Manhattan, Swallow and Charles, that is Ralston Charles, prepared to board the A train to go back to Brooklyn. So it's like, you know, like 7 in the morning. And this is what Swallow said. So there was this guy coming up the stairs from the subway. And we were, go we were going down, and this guy says to us, Hey, man, subway is jammed, man, it's jammed. Which means, of course, it was crowded. So Charlie looks at me, and I look at him, and all of a sudden things start popping. I say, wow, subway jam, yeah. So I wrote the song Subway Jam, right here in Brooklyn. I just made up the story, like you have all these trains going in different directions, A, G, G F. And then I'm thinking about how Brooklyn is made up of people from so many different islands. Antigua, Trinidad, Barbados, you know. And back then, most of them didn't have cars, so they all rode the subways. So I wanted to get all the different island people involved with the music, so everyone would buy a copy of the record. Uh, so I mean, at first I'm saying, wow, you're really celebrating multicultural uh, West Indian culture here in Brooklyn. He says, yeah, I'm doing that, but I also want to sell records. <laughs> so it's kind of a series. It's an interesting kind of intersection of, of commerce and you know, kind of multicultural um, philosophy. And uh, so uh, he's taking advantage of it. So anyway, there's. Um, uh, swallow and Subway Jam. Uh, so that's kind of the way the book is laid out. Um, you know, I encourage you to look at it. It is available on Amazon, uh, and there are a couple copies in the library here. And if people really need copies, you can talk to me. Uh, but at this point, what I'd like to do is to now introduce you to some of the people whose stories are in the book, and you know, who make the book what it is. And by the way, almost everybody in the book lives probably within maybe two or three miles here at Brooklyn College. So this is definitely local history, yeah? Uh, so. Um